Hello and welcome back to this damn full idealistic crusade. This video is a review of the James Curtis biography of William Cameron Menzies entitled The Shape of Films to Come. Of course, a play on things to come. Uh, James Curtis is one of the best uh, film or film subject biographers working today and has written a number of my favorite biographies, such as his books on James Whale and Spencer Tracy, among many others. And he just recently, not too long ago, did a really great book on Buster Keaton. So uh, he is definitely one of the names that you see and you know you're going to get your money's worth in terms of the research put in, the quality of the writing, and the sort of sketch you get of of the subject in terms of getting more of an idea of who they were like as a person. Now, uh, the only issue with the Menzies book is there doesn't seem to have been quite as uh, uh, much of an extensive amount of material that Curtis had to go on. So in some areas, it might be a a little less drawn out than one of his very extensive biographies. But uh, to be honest, you get such a sense of the man and more detail about his career than I think anywhere else you'll find <laughs> that uh, you, you certainly still get a, an, a, an idea of, of who Menzies was as a person. And uh, you do get enough about his personal life and in addition to great details about his career. But you, you can definitely tell that there might be some instances where there's maybe not as much material as um, some of the other subjects he's written about. And that's not a bad thing. That's just just a sign of uh, not only, you know, what exists in uh, research materials and, and things like that in, in terms of materials about a person, but I think it's also representative of how there are certain individuals who, especially if they never got the credit they really deserved when they were still alive and working, there's obviously not going to be as much first-hand material about them as somebody who was a much bigger name. And Menzies is, without question, one of the single most underrated names in the entire history of the motion picture industry. Uh, simply for his artistry, his contributions to the development of the motion picture as we know it, uh, the, the way films are crafted, and his sense of visual design is absolutely without parallel. He is one of those individuals you come across and you quickly realize that uh, they were so far ahead of their time that most people really didn't seem to fully grasp what it was uh, they were doing or working towards. And to be quite honest, uh, no one has ever come close to even approaching what Menzies was doing and basically pioneering the whole concept of what we now refer to as production designer. And in fact, that term was basically invented for what Menzies was doing, particularly on his most famous film work, which of course is Gone with the Wind. And to have that notch in your belt, you know, is certainly a, uh, a reason to be remembered. But Menzies was far, far more than that. Uh, he started in the silent era, and of course Menzies was an artist, but he was the one to basically take the principles of art and fine art and try to apply that in the visual medium. And he realized that movies had to not only move, but they had to also convey everything through their visuals. And that meant lighting and camera placement and set design and set dressing and props and costumes and stagings of, of performers and actors and actresses, that the entire image to every last facet was uh, not only important, but had to be directly tied to the story that was being told at that particular moment in time. He also wound up inventing essentially what we now refer to as the storyboard. And to simply call Menzies' drawings mere storyboards is uh, just a complete understatement because uh, the man would draw these incredibly intensive pieces of art, really, that had every last detail sketched in there so much so that uh, for certain productions and some people they would literally just shoot his sketches because he was basically drawing the actual shot right down to the shadow detail and the costumes and the 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 position of the actors faces and doing long shots and close-ups and medium shots and having an incredible sense of depth of field 
in addition to his designs, uh, his most famous work in the silent era, and what really made his name was Douglas Fairbanks and others recognizing his talent and sort of tapping him to do The Thief of Baghdad. So uh, he, he certainly came in with a bang and was very much known in and among the industry as as a sort of, uh, you know, I don't think they called him a pioneer, but he basically was. And I think they kind of, you know, everybody kind of picked up on that. But, you know, it, it seemed like he, he didn't quite have the full ability to utilize his talents because it would be, you know, dependent on the production and people didn't really know what to do with, with some of the things he would come up with unless it was a big, super gargantuan production like Thief of Baghdad or later Gone with the Wind, um, or if he actually, Menzies was actually given more creative control. And he did eventually start directing, and all of the films he directed or co-directed have an incredible visual stamp on them. So while they may not always be the greatest films dramatically, or uh, they may not be perfect films, you can't fault their visuals. That's why Things to Come still remains iconic, or some of the visuals in Shandu the Magician are just absolutely incredible and well ahead of their time. And then, of course, you get to the iconic Invaders from Mars, and the reason why that film terrifies every kid who ever sees it and they never forget it uh, is the fact that the visuals alone are eerie and haunting as all hell, and the film is essentially designed to be a sort of expressionist nightmare nightmare from a child's perspective. Um, you know, it's one of the most exquisitely uh, visually designed films you're ever likely to see, and that's all William Cameron Menzies. And again, his, his sort of, you know, grand crowning achievement would most likely be Gone with the Wind, because when you think about Gone with the Wind, what's the first thing you think of? the visuals. And you also have to, if you want to play the auteur theory, you can't really do that with Gone with the Wind because there were multiple directors, uh, multiple uncredited directors, and the real driving force was David O. Selznick. But you know, Selznick was wanting the best for his film, and of course he swore up and down he had to have it designed by William Cameron Menzies. Again, came up with the concept term of production designer to actually give Menzies a more appropriate credit. But Menzies basically, if there was one sort of cohesive creative force in Gone with the Wind besides Selznick's infatigable energy and endless memos and driving everybody to the point of a nervous breakdown, it was Menzies. And Menzies nearly exhausted himself on Gone with the Wind. And that's why the number one thing everybody will remember is always going to be the visuals. The design of Gone with the Wind, right down to every last facet, is far beyond anything Hollywood had done up to that point in terms of opulence, detail, and scale. And that was all William Cameron Menzies. So uh, you see any film he had anything to do with, and even if he's not credited, the more you study his work, his fingerprints are all over it. Um, all you have to do is look at uh, just any random shot from Things to Come, which he directed, and is most famous for its visions of the future based on H.G. Wells' writing. Um, but if you look at any single shot, it's not just the future visions or the bombed out rubble after a, after a world war, um, because the film takes place over multiple time periods. But you look at any shot in that film, and the composition of every single shot is meticulously staged, right down to the fact that there is in, in almost practically every camera setup, an incredible depth of field. Uh, Menzies was really also a pioneer of the deep focus technique, and one of his greatest fans was Orson Welles. So uh, people who really knew motion pictures and who really cared, and and the, the critics who were really tuned in on the artistry of motion pictures, you know, people who really knew films at the time, they knew the specific names of the real talents that didn't get bandied about, and they all knew who Menzies was. And so if Menzies' name was on a film, you knew it definitely meant something. Now, unfortunately, uh, and the the one element that does seem sort of, um, you know, a sudden where it pops up in Curtis's book, and again, I think this goes into the fact that there's not as much information about uh, Menzies' private life as uh, one would hope, so, you know, it makes it a little bit more limited. Um, apparently, he did have a, or, or I don't know if it was lifelong, but he did develop a, a quite substantial drinking problem, and that suddenly pops up about 
halfway through the book, and uh, that does seem to have um, at least curtailed his career at certain points, uh, but he was seemingly able to to get it going again. But uh, it also didn't help that all the films he directed were not giant box office hits. They were usually compromised in some way or sort of demoted to B-pictures, or they were B-pictures, or in the case of Things to Come, it was such a sort of odd beast of a film at the time and unfortunately due to wells's writing incredibly philosophical so <laughs> it was it was definitely a hard sell it was very impressive but it didn't make a crap ton of money like uh, alexander corda had hoped so menzies had also kind of developed a reputation of you know, he, he's a great designer to have but you know don't don't let him direct or you're not gonna make your money back and that wasn't really his fault but um he he remained a just an incredible talent up until the day he died and to be quite frank has never gotten the level of credit and, and adoration that he deserves and when you actually look at his work and read this biography you're just going to come away with with just an incredible appreciation for somebody who really pioneered things that people take for granted and believed in the motion picture to such a degree uh, that uh, most people, again, couldn't really fathom what he was doing. And, you know, yes, there have been great legendary production designers after Menzies, but few, agonizingly few, have that have a similar sense of how to design the entire world of a film in every single set and shot uh, and right down to even the tiniest bits of set dressing and how the lighting is going to affect things. Uh, really, the, the only the, the name that comes to mind who kind of uh, at least picked up the torch that, that Menzies had, had lit and, and carried it a bit further is Ken Adam. And Ken Adam did actually work with Menzies at, at, at some point. So there, I guess there was a sort of, again, that there was a feeling of a sort of passing of the torch, but Menzies pioneered everything. And he even worked on films and had things to do with films that he didn't get credit for. And uh, once you realize that his hand was on it somewhere, you know, he, he's got his fingers in it, it suddenly makes sense why there are set pieces or moments or incredible images that stand out so vividly in the mind that stick with you that you you can't forget that you remember even more than the rest of the film and it's like well they had Menzies come in and design those shots or or he had he had a hand and and uh you know he drew his type of storyboards uh which the book does reproduce a lot of those um it, it, the man was just an incredible talent and is one of the names that should be revered and put on a pedestal but because he didn't get the big budget name recognition uh, during his lifetime and by the end of his career it, it, he had not had the the same sort of um, uh, industry recognition and, and it kind of been seemingly perceived on a, a more of a downward trajectory um, and the fact that he wasn't a director and and you can't label the auteur theory on on his work although in the films he directed in the films he had control over you can um if if you like the auteur theory he is a name that should be studied there should be entire college courses in film schools entirely devoted to the work of william cameron menzies that is how important his contribution to the motion picture art form is and once you uh, at least get an idea of this, when you see Invaders from Mars, when you see Things to Come, when you see Gone with the Wind, and you dig into their production history, and you see the same name popping up over and over and over again. And most of all, when you see some of his, you know, what he would simply call drawings, and what other people might just label as storyboards, I mean, they belong in an art museum. Uh, they're, they're that detailed and gorgeous and beautiful and breathtaking and you can already completely envision the film because it's right there on paper he's already done all of it uh, so again there are entire films that uh, especially the films he made uh, he designed and sam wood directed or uh, especially uh, the real standout is king's row for warner brothers uh, where Menzies basically sketched out the entire film and would would just shoot it. Uh, it it's just 
unbelievable what what Menzies achieved. And again, he was so far ahead of everybody else. I don't think he was properly recognized. I don't think they could even fathom what he was doing. Um, he, he wasn't necessarily what you'd term an actor's director. So the films he directed are, are usually known as, you know, not not really performance based. It's more about the overall experience. And he freely admitted, you know, he wasn't an actor's director because he was so obsessed with the visual and I think even Menzies could maybe understand the the sort of criticism others might have of you know you can have a beautiful image but you know it, it has to move and as soon as you move the image is changed and such, um, but no one has ever approached what Menzies did in in the motion picture realm and a lot of his technique and a lot of the precedence he kind of set just got folded into everyday work, although not to the, the same quality standard, of course, and not the same visionary level. Um, but the basic concepts have gotten so indoctrinated that people just take them for granted. And to closely study Menzies' work, as you should, uh, you're just going to marvel. I mean, there's the influence on Orson Welles alone. You, you just look at any shot in Citizen Kane, and if you have any knowledge of Menzies, you see echoes of Menzies throughout Kane and Ambersons and everything Orson Welles ever did. Uh, so I think Menzies is just as big of an influence on Wells as John Ford, and Wells would talk about and defend Menzies uh, in interviews. So if you dig around and, and you read a lot of Wells' interviews or, or watch a lot of interviews, you will see him talk about Menzies from time to time. Um, so, I mean, his influence on those who knew and appreciated his work is is tremendous. But his influence on the motion picture in general as an art form, I mean, he is one of the very few people that just came in and took something that, that was pre-existing and just elevated it to such a high that, again, people couldn't really fathom what he was doing. They knew it was great. Uh, they, but they didn't quite get what he was after fully, and so I don't think he was ever given the the proper level of recognition and and honors that he so richly deserved. And nobody has really ever matched him. Nobody could then. Nobody certainly can now. And he's really without parallel. He is the greatest production designer who ever lived, um, closely followed by Ken Adam, who sort of he Adam had his own style. But I think he was very cognizant of what Menzies was after and, and again, sort of picked up and carried the torch. And, and so it's, it's the great production designers who naturally aspire to and do a lot of the uh, core ideals of what Menzies brought to all of his work. So again, I, I, I want to stress uh, for anyone who wants to know more about motion pictures as an art form and the development of the visual style of motion pictures, particularly in the Hollywood studio system era, there are a very few select number of names that you really need to know. And number one on the list, chief amongst all of those names, is William Cameron Menzies, one of the most underrated talents in all of motion picture history. And the fact that his work is not taught in college courses is absolutely insane because the man was a brilliant artist and everything he ever did belongs in a museum. So now we turn to Curtis's book, which in the hardcover edition has this absolutely gorgeous jacket, which has some of Menzies' incredible drawings, which again, he would just simply call drawings, but they are all pieces of art that belong on any museum's wall. And you have this nice reflective effect on the actual title. The drawings continue onto the spine and the rear. So this is one of those really well-designed biographies that you you definitely want the hardcover edition because the cover is so beautiful. And as I alluded to before, you open the jacket and the blurb here means you need to read this because the blurb is from Orson Welles himself. Menzies is a man impossible to overpraise. As always, Orson is exactly right. He Menzies is impossible to overpraise. And of course, the book is absolutely loaded with photographs, images of sets, and of course, 
Menzies's art. So you get to see a lot of his pre-production drawings, a lot of his storyboards, a lot of his sketches, and basically get inside his creative process to such an incredible degree. And some more stills from Thief of Baghdad. So it actually has nice stills from his entire career going along. So it's not just images for, you know, the most famous hits and things. And again, even in his drawings, he was a master of composition and shadow and depth and was in his own way pioneering what would later be termed as the deep focus technique. Then in the center, we get some selections of color stills as well including even a watercolor of Tara from Gone with the Wind. I love that they actually printed selections from the opening montage sequence of Things to Come, which is one of the most striking cinematic examples of the montage in the entire decade. It's absolutely stunning. And then the money shot, if you will, of the final version of the future every town at the end section of Things to Come. Of course, the most extensive focus on any one film is Gone with the Wind, and we even get his actual production sketches in what would basically be seen today as storyboard form. And then me being a Hitchcock nerd, it was really fascinating to read about how Menzies actually did do some significant work on Foreign Correspondent, even building off some of his incredible work from the film version of Our Town. So he did work on some of the even most iconic bits of Foreign Correspondent. And once I, I knew he had some involvement, but until reading this, I, I never knew just how deeply that went. And once you realize that factor, it makes sense why some of the visuals in Foreign Correspondent really jump out at you and burn themselves into your brain and even stand apart from other things in the Hitchcock canon around the same time period. And then here is an image of Menzies actually doing drawings on his script and doing his actual um, full pieces of art for King's Row. Again, all you have to do is take a look at any image from a Menzies uh, film, whether he just designed it or he directed it as well, and you can see his sense of depth and focus and staging to convey emotion and story. And just look at any one image like this and tell me that he wasn't a giant influence on Orson Welles. And then also he happened to work on a film that uh, was starting as one project, but then kind of kind of stagnated and eventually was restarted under a completely different title. So here are his preliminary sketches for the opening of an early version of The Greatest Gift, which of course uh, eventually became It's a Wonderful Life. So this is a just exceptional biography as all of Curtis's books that I've read are. Uh, it is a little slimmer than some of those. It, with all the notes included, it's about uh, 400 some odd pages. So again, I think that's also because there's just not quite as much uh, material out there about uh, Menzies and his personal life. So I think Curtis has done the best job humanly possible with what's out there. But uh, again, my only real uh, note would be that uh, when he does talk about uh, Menzies' alcohol alcoholism it does seem a bit out of left field uh, in terms of there's there's not really any buildup it's just all of a sudden oh yeah and there's this um, but again I think that's just because there's not as much material as you would get in most biographies about somebody's personal life simply because uh, the primary materials that he would have researched there's just simply not as much of them so there's, there's, there's not as much that you can then use to fill in the gaps, essentially. Um, but yeah, I, I know other people have, have noted that who have read this, that it's it's just a, a little bit sudden and jarring where, where it comes up about that um, he had an alcohol problem um, that uh, you know started to affect his career here and there. Um, but again, I think that's just a sign that, you know, because he wasn't as um, well-renowned during his lifetime, there's just not quite as much uh, first-hand material that uh, you have to pull from to then, again, fill in those sort of gaps. So I do think this is an essential must-read biography, as are all of Curtis's biographies I've read so far. So this goes on the shelf with his Spencer Tracy book, his James Whale book, and many others. Uh, Menzies is a name that should be better known, better respected, and more discussed among the whole film community, really, and the fact that there are not 
college courses in film schools that are entirely devoted to Menzies or um, art programs or um, museum shows really is is really criminal because his his work is that important that unbelievably impressive and that undeniably uh, game changing uh, and I, I don't think there is a better person to study to better understand the visual power of the motion picture medium and to study somebody who basically took a, a form of media and tried to just completely elevate it as much as humanly possible and do things nobody had done or, or really thought of. And um, his, his influence is such that, again, those who know really know. So I, I, I hope I can encourage people to look at Menzies' work and maybe read the Curtis biography and, and, and at least understand just how important Menzies was and still is to this very day to the motion picture medium. And you know, hopefully someday there, there might be a, a, a museum exhibition or at the very least there should be film school courses entirely devoted to to the genius artistry of William Cameron Menzies. So as always, I hope my babblings about films, film culture, film books, and biographies has been at least somewhat fun and informative. Um, Menzies is one of those people that the more I find out about him and the more of his work that I actually see and experience, I just can't help but simply feel this big. It's just one of those I am not worthy type, type moments and... He not only worked with so many uh, legends in the film industry, but himself is a legend, just one of those legends that only diehard cinephiles and, and film history scholars are, are going to be more aware of, which is absolutely a shame because his name should be legendary amongst a great number of people, amongst everyone, because that is how impactful and important his, his work was. Uh, so I do encourage anyone interested in the development of motion pictures to read the James Curtis biography of William Cameron Menzies and to explore Menzies' work in terms of design, but also the films he directed, which are all visual standouts. Uh, again, once you see Menzies' work and you know it's it's his work, he has a, such a particular visual style and such a, such visual power and everything he ever did that it's it's really unmistakable and then you can also see how it influenced everyone else and once you see that you know you you can't unsee it and it's it's so far beyond everybody else that <laughs> it, it definitely is an unfair comparison to to see a Menzies design film next to something else from the same studio made in the, at, the, at the same time. They are not cut from the same cloth, and you you can't underestimate Menzies' influence on Wells either. I mean, it's just it's it's there, and I think that uh, Wells was drawing on on what he saw and appreciated in Menzies's work even though he was a you know self-professed uh cinematic uh, beginner uh, well I think even as a cinematic beginner Wells was able to notice hey why are these movies so much more impressive and why are they so visually overpowering and then you look through the credits and you see the same name pop up over and over and over again that's Menzies and he really was the, the the greatest production designer who ever lived and that just even calling him a production designer is just that's not even the, the a title worthy of of what of all the things he did so he really was a a visual jack of all trades a complete and total artist and really one of the most important people in the history and development of the motion picture as an art form so I do encourage people to check out the James Curtis book and support your local independent bookstores wherever possible. Uh, please do keep reading film books and biographies to get a better understanding of film history and to help keep film culture alive. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching.